So Colossians chapter 3. Slaves, obey in everything those who are currently your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Well, thank you so much, Tom and Rich. Isn't this a fun time of year when the St. Helens staff go away for some reason and the city workers take over? Who knows what's going to happen? Um, I'd like to start by asking us a question. And it's what I call a double-decker question in that there are a couple of layers. It might seem trivial, might have quite a trivial answer, or the answer that comes to your head might be quite deep, even existential. Here's the question. It's on the sheet. The question is, what gets you up in the morning? What gets you up in the morning? Um, Somebody asked this question on an online message board. Here were some of the answers that were given. Somebody says, my bills, my bills get me up in the morning. Uh, Another person said, my wife. My wife gets me up in the morning. And I like this one, it's so thoughtful. It said, I like having things more than I hate working. That's quite a good answer to that question. What gets you up in the morning? But that is an existential question, isn't it? What gets you up in the morning? Because the question behind the the question really is, well, for what reason am I doing what I'm doing every day? Have you ever had one of those moments where you kind of put your hand on your head and you go, what am I doing? Just what am I doing? And you step back from life and you ask that. Is there meaning and purpose to my life? And Paul writes this letter in the first century to a small group of Christians in Colossae. And he starts by explaining that actually there is an answer to this cosmic question of meaning and purpose in life. And the answer is to be found in Jesus Christ. The answer is in Jesus Christ. See, he starts the letter by explaining that Jesus Christ is God and made the world and through his death and resurrection is Lord today. He's running things right now. And not only that, anyone can put their faith in Jesus Christ. Then if they choose to do that, believe in him, Jesus promises to forgive our sins and make us alive spiritually. Paul explains all of this. And not only that, he offers us what he calls an inheritance and not an inheritance of grandmother's old wristwatch, but an inheritance of eternal life after death with him. So now, if you like, as we look at the world, we see two realities. There's that reality that we see every day, maybe what's trivial, what's in front of us. But then there's this heavenly reality as Paul looks at it. So we we see this when we see the world. And as we confront this this tension, Paul says, put these on. What am I going to look like? Put these on the gospel glasses, through which we see the world differently. And the question is this today for us over the next few minutes. As I put the gospel glasses on, how will I see the workplace? As I put the gospel glasses on, how is it going to change how I see my nine to five? Uh, Paul tells us to put the gospel glasses on at the beginning of chapter three. I'll just read it out for us. A couple of verses. Paul says, If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So we put the gospel glasses on. If we're Christian, if we're believers here today, we're going we're gonna to really want to get clear on this because the working world is changing. And we've all got lots of decisions we can make, things like working from home or whether to go in the office or what our working patterns will be like over the next few years. So it's really key that we listen to this. If we wouldn't call ourselves Christian and we're listening today, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Well, I hope we see that actually the difference Jesus makes to the working life 
isn't only in line with the reality that we're living in in the world, but is also actually the best way of working. I hope we see that. So here we go. Let's put the gospel glasses on and let's see what difference it makes. And as we put the gospel glasses on, I won't keep this on the whole time. As we put the gospel glasses on, we see one big key difference and it's six words at the end of verse 24. I don't know if you noticed, six words at the end of verse 24, you are serving the Lord Christ. You are serving the Lord Christ. Uh, I've got an organisational chart at work. I can kind of go into some system and see where everyone sits within the organisation. And it's as though I seal my org chart with a dotted line above me. There's me, Ali Blundy, and then there's Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. You are serving the Lord Christ. And so what that means for us is that work itself is a spiritual activity. Work is a spiritual activity. Uh, This is huge news for the Colossians. Uh, People were telling them all sorts of things about why they weren't real Christians. People trying to delude them, pass judgment on them for not doing the right religious things, trying to disqualify them, saying things like, well, you don't see visions and dream dreams and worship angels, so you can't be proper spiritual people. But no, Paul says, put the gospel glasses on and see that when you work, you are personally serving Jesus Christ. And what could be more spiritual than that? I find this so hard to remember. I really do. I find this so hard to remember. I've just never been taught to think about work like this. Nobody ever mentioned this to me at the careers department at school. But this just changes everything when we understand it. That when I open the spreadsheet in the morning, when I wipe the tables, maybe I'm running a company and I'm doing billion dollar deals, whatever I'm doing, the most significant thing is that I am personally serving Jesus Christ when I do it. And what a thing to get me up in the morning. Today is a day where I can personally serve Jesus Christ. Another thing this means, of course, is that no job is essentially more valuable than another. Uh, It says it in uh, verse 23, I think, whatever you do, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Uh, One of my good mates is a doctor. I was speaking to him last week, and he said one of the most frustrating things for him is when he goes into church and people ask, what do you do? And he says, I'm a doctor. And they say, oh, that's so good of you. That is so good for you to be a doctor, as if there is some heightened level of spiritual um, credibility in being a doctor. And he said, it really annoys me, Ali, because there isn't. I'm just, I'm just doing a job like everyone else is, seeking to serve Jesus in it. And for us, we may be out of work at the moment. We may have just been made redundant and it's really painful. Or maybe we're not working for other reasons. We might be retired. And this truth is that being in work is not essentially more valuable than not being in work. Because those of us in work, we're doing what every Christian is doing. We're just seeking to serve the Lord Jesus in work. So we put the gospel glasses on and I see that I'm serving Jesus But the question still stands, how is that actually going to change the nine to five? How is it going to change my annual review when it comes around? I think in these verses we had read out, I think we see three things about how it might change us concretely in the workplace. And the first thing is this, and it's on the sheet. It means that we can work sincerely. It means that we can work sincerely. It's verses 23 to 25. Oh, sorry, verse 22. Verse 22. Bond servants, servants, slaves, means the same thing. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. I don't know if you've experienced it in the workplace, but it is so crippling when somebody's main priority is their reputation and what other people think about them in the workplace. Just always trying to please other people. I was certainly like this when I first started in insurance. I was desperate to do things a bit more publicly within the team that were quite flashy or impressive so that people would think I'm brilliant. And I remember creating this kind of financial reporting dashboard or something, and it looked really good and the colors looked amazing, but I I didn't really know what the code was doing behind it, but I thought, oh, I'll just bluff it. And when I demonstrated it to the wider team, of course it didn't work and it broke and it completely fell flat on its face. And that was quite crushing for me because I wasn't really working sincerely. I wasn't working sincerely. If I was working sincerely, 
I would have put much more time on it and had the guts to say, you know what, I haven't quite finished it yet. I'm sorry about that. Give me another week. But if we're serving Jesus, we can work sincerely because we don't care that much about our reputation. And therefore, we'll do those unseen jobs that nobody else really wants to do and that we're not going to get credit for. So if I'm serving the Lord Christ, I don't need to worry about what people think of me. I can work sincerely knowing that Jesus' opinion is the, re- is the only one that matters. It's the only one that matters. And maybe at work, we really fear people. Maybe we're scared at work and we fear people. Well, that's the other thing here. I don't need to fear anyone but the Lord. Fear the Lord, end of verse 22. Well, that's the first concrete difference it might make. We can work sincerely. And secondly, with the gospel glasses on, it means that we can work hard. We can work hard. Verses 23 to 25. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done and there's no partiality. Maybe we are tempted uh, not to work as hard as we could work. Or maybe we think that for some reason, hard work is undignified or unfitting for the Christian. Maybe we think that. Now, I want us to imagine, our phones are probably all on silent, but imagine it buzzes now and you take it out your pocket and it's the CEO of your company or somebody really, really important. I probably couldn't do this, but I'm guessing if you were sitting there and it was the CEO, you might quietly go to the back of the room and leave, or you'd put your computer on mute and you'd pick up the phone, because it's the CEO. And if the CEO asks me to do something, I do it at light speed. Well, verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. How much more with Jesus Christ? And thinking about it, All the CEO can give me is maybe a salary, maybe a bonus if we're lucky enough, maybe a bit of job security. But look what Jesus can give me. Actually, no, not can give me, will give me. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You will receive it. We may be having a really, really tough time at work. We may be having a real tough time. We might be paid poorly. Um, We might not be treated very well. Well, let's remember here that Jesus offers us a more competitive remuneration package than anything on LinkedIn. And verse 25, if people do wrong us, we don't need to harbor resentment because they will be repaid. Nobody gets away with it. How liberating not to have to harbor resentment in work when people wrong us, but just to get on with working hard because we're working for the Lord. That's so liberating. Now, at the moment, some people, some of us, are are considering whether we might want to come into work, maybe come September, more days a week than we might have to by our employers. I've certainly been talking this through with some of my Christian friends. For the sake of our Christian witness, we might actually want to get on the train and spend the money and come into London when when we're not asked to by our firms, but for the sake of being here for our Christian witness. And this really helps me think that through. It's worth the sacrifice because I'm going to get the inheritance from Jesus Christ as my reward. So it really diminishes in my mind the cost of doing those things. This helps us think through those kind of gospel-minded decisions in our working patterns. They're the first two things. We can work sincerely. We can work hard. And then the final thing, um, more briefly, we can be a good boss. We can be a good boss. This is first verse of chapter 4. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So imagine that org chart that I spoke about earlier with the dotted lines between people. As you go to the top, you find that nobody on the organization chart is above Jesus. Nobody is. Everybody reports to Jesus. Masters, you've also got a master in heaven. And so if at some point in our careers, or maybe now it's true that we we are managing people, we're responsible for people at work, let's remember that we have a master in heaven. Jesus is my boss. And so I'll treat people rightly and fairly. And not because of what the HR department might say. That's not the reason. And not because my friends might say that I'm a bad boss. That's not the reason. 
is because I've got a master in heaven. And imagine what the city would be like if every boss was like that. It would be a completely different place and for the better. We can be a good boss. Well, there you go. That's the three things. What gets you up in the morning? Well, Jesus is real. His kingdom is real. So put those gospel glasses on. And it helps me see that I'm personally serving Jesus at work. So I can work sincerely, I can work hard, and I can be a good boss. But I don't know about you, I'm still thinking something's missing here. Something's missing here, which is that, okay, if I work hard all my life and I achieve brilliant things in my career, it's true, isn't it, that it won't be long until it's completely forgotten. And it pales into insignificance. Anything I can achieve at work pales into insignificance compared with Jesus' eternal kingdom, this inheritance that he offers me today. And that's why I think Paul tells us verses 2 to 6, to remind us that whatever we do for work, there is something of lasting value we throw our weight behind. Let me read verses 2 to 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This thing of lasting value is, of course, Jesus' kingdom. More people, week by week, becoming Christian and gaining this inheritance just like those of us today who believe in Jesus have this inheritance. And we are going to have a talk, I think it's in two or three weeks' time, focusing on this, how we, how we can commit ourselves to this gospel, to the eternal inheritance while we're at work. But for now, I just want to finish by reading those six words at the end of verse 24 again, and then I'll close in prayer. You are serving the Lord Christ. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for how simple this is, that every day we can wake up and know that we're personally serving Jesus Christ, whatever we do. We do pray, Father, that you'd help us both to understand this and then have the will to remember it and to obey it. In Jesus' name, amen.